Just for a little review, let's go over some of the basic facts of life. A. Everyone loves ducks. B. Everyone loves dinosaurs. So, with some simple arithmetic, we should be able to figure out that duck dinosaurs are, theoretically, the most magnificent organisms on Earth. On a more serious note, this video is not complete nonsense. A lot of prehistoric life mirrors organisms from today, usually in both appearance and what role it fulfills in its environment. This is called convergent evolution, and just one example of this is some dinosaurs and weatherfowl, or in this case simply ducks. Of course, how many duck dinosaurs can there possibly be? Let's just say more than you probably expect. Although not an example of convergent evolution, but instead probably just a creature that may pop into your head when you think of duck-like dinosaurs is the duck-billed dinosaurs, or hadrosaurs. And although what old cartoons like Fantasia might tell you, these guys weren't swamp-dwelling amphibious lizards. Instead, hadrosaurs were highly adapted for a terrestrial lifestyle, and maybe more than any other group, dominated the land of the dinosaurs during their final era of the Cretaceous. Most discredit the duck-billed dinosaurs as essentially the Ringo star of dinosaurs, overshadowed by the intimidating Tyrannosaurs and Ceratopsians. But hadrosaurs are some of the most understood dinosaurs, and through their numerous excellent fossils of them, we know so much more about their appearance and behavior than others. But first, why do we have so many fossils of duck-billed dinosaurs? Of course, more fossils means more animals, and these animals were numerous, being called the cows of the Cretaceous. The reason is due to their highly efficient bodies. One of the most important parts of being a big herbivore is how much nutrients you get, and hadrosaurs, with their trademark broad beak, cheeks, and numerous batteries of teeth, can quickly chew through even the toughest of vegetation. By breaking down the food beforehand, hadrosaurs did not have to expend as much energy digesting that food. Hadrosaurs were also highly mobile animals. They probably walked the most on all four of their feet. However, due to their huge, stiff tails, they could balance on just their back legs. This allowed them to run, and run rather fast. Although not equipped with horns and armor, hadrosaurs could just skedaddle and probably outrun their tyrannosaur predators. Another key defensive measure for hadrosaurs is, well, more hadrosaurs. As we see in nature today, herds are great for stopping predation. More animals means more eyes that can alert the herd for predators, and no matter if you are a T-Rex, a hundred ton wall of flesh will always be hard to fight. Now that we know why they're so successful, we can look at the many fossils of duck-billed dinosaurs. From their numerous fossils, we know of a ton of species of hadrosaurs, all of which are grouped into two families of Lambiosaurinae and Saurolophinae. Lambiosaurs are known for their ornate bony crests that were probably used to make noises for communicating with other members of their herd, as well as to attract mates for the males. Members of the family include the helmeted Carithosaurus, the iconic Parasaurolophus, and Jindosaurus, which, yes, has the skull of a unicorn, but I reassure you, it did not look nearly as goofy in life. Sorolophinae lack these crests, but have their own interesting members. They were usually larger than Lamiosaurians, and one genus, Shantungosaurus, could have grown as long as 15 meters and weighed 16 tons, the same way as about three bull African elephants. Myasaura, a name which means good mother, is well deserved for this animal, as a fossilized nest with hatchlings and babies proved that hadrosaurs incubated and took care of their young, another clear piece of evidence that hadrosaurs were very social creatures. However, one of the most iconic hadrosaurs is the genus Edmontosaurus, which has numerous incredibly well-preserved fossils known as dinosaur mummies, which are some of the best ways at knowing how these animals looked while alive. One specimen is UAL VP 53722, which revealed that the species Edmontosaurus regalis has a fleshy, rooster-like comb on the top of its head. AMNH 5060 is one of the first dinosaur mummies discovered, and showed that Edmontosaurus and presumably all hadrosaurs were covered in non-overlapping circular scales of various sizes. Quite possibly the most well-preserved large dinosaur ever discovered is an Edmontosaurus known as Dakota who not only had skin impressions, but also a well-preserved foot that appears to show hadrosaurs had hoof-like nails that covered the bottom of their feet. The muscles and tendons of the animal were preserved enough to, for researchers to calculate the top speed of the animal, which was 45 kilometers an hour. The incredibly intact scales also have different size and shapes, which might correlate to different colors, which would allow scientists to estimate the color pattern of an animal more than 65 million years old. So before you can call duck-billed dinosaurs boring, 
realize hadrosaurs and their fossils have allowed us to see into the world of the Mesozoic like no other dinosaur. We shall now skip from the unducked duck dinosaurs to the truly duck-like duck dinosaurs, as in animals who actually hold physical and evolutionary similarities with ducks and other wetlands birds. Coincidentally, the group of dinosaurs also shares many similarities with all birds. Of course, I'm talking about dromaeosaurs, or as you may know them, the raptors, which in Latin means robber. To give those uninitiated a quick info dump, those scaly xenomorphs we called velociraptors in the Jurassic Park movies are thought of as wildly inaccurate in modern times, and presumably all raptors were covered in rather advanced feathers, making them fluffy, still rather menacing animals. Most Gromaeosaurs were probably lightly built terrestrial predators, similar to their modern bird of prey ancestors. However, one group of Dromaeosaurs show possible signs of living a more watery life. The Unenlaginii family is the only group of Dromaeosaurs known in the southern hemisphere, and some of its members have evolved rather differently than the rest of the Dromaeosaurs. Look at one genus of Unenlaginii in particular, Oscaraptor, which was as tall as a man. Oscoraptor had highly reduced forearms compared to other dromaeosaurs, which were necessary for grappling onto large prey that most raptors hunted. Its mouth is also elongated with small conical teeth, which are better for grabbing small creatures than for tearing flesh like other dromaeosaur teeth. This evidence points to the idea that Oscoraptor, along with relatives like Beechiraptor and Unilagia, were piscivores, meaning they primarily ate fish, just like a duck. I mean, ducks aren't really known for birds that eat fish. It's more of a heron thing. We can all suspend our disbelief. Now, if you're some boring saltine cracker of a person like, uh, for example, Wikipedia, you'll claim that this all shows they just hunted down small terrestrial animals. Pfft, why would you really trust a website who looked this exciting? But really, we can all speculate about a feathered raptor prowling the wetlands of the Mesozoic for fish. Now, let's move on to animals much bigger and much duckier. I introduce you to Spinosaurus. But to really understand the odyssey of this creature, we have to go back to 1912, when famed paleontologist Ernst Schromer found fragmented fossils belonging to a particularly large theropod in Egypt, with its most exotic feature being its huge neural spines, which is what Schromer named it after. The holotype remained intact until it faced the bane of all fossils' existence, which, as we all know, is Hitler. See, Schrummer was a German paleontologist, and the holotype was stored in the city of Munich until Allied bombing raids destroyed the Munich Museum and therefore the Spinosaurus fossil. With only drawings remaining, Spinosaurus fell into obscurity. However, in the 90s and 2000s, Spinosaurus got a boost. More fossils were found, and relatives of Spinosaurus, like Baryonyx and Suchomimus, were found, which showed more and more of this animal which had appeared to be a crocodile-like creature with large claws and a long snout to eat fish. Size estimations suggest it was about 15 meters long and 12 to 20 tons, making it the largest carnivorous dinosaur and terrestrial predator ever. It also got the spotlight in the critically acclaimed hit movie Jurassic Park 3, making it popular. It seemed we had finally figured out Spinosaurus until a subadult skeleton in 2014 was described. This showed Spinosaurus was a bit uh, stunted. Those tiny legs threw the world into chaos, and Spinosaurus became one of the weirdest dinosaurs known. The original 2014 papers suggest Spinosaurus' center of mass was near the front of the animal, meaning it had to walk on its knuckles like a gorilla. However, new research suggests the center of mass was between the hips, meaning it could walk on its hind limbs, although rather awkwardly. Another idea thrown around was the creature was an animal highly evolved for diving and swimming through fresh water for fish. However, the creature's buoyancy would have made it almost completely incapable of diving, and the animal's odd shape would have made it prone to tipping over while swimming. How majestic. After all of this mayhem cleared up, we now have a stable view on what Spinosaurus aegypticus was. Spinosaurus was a massive predator, possibly heavier than the T-Rex, with a bizarre sail taller than a grown man. The new discoveries on Spinosaurus suggest it was still highly adapted for an aquatic lifestyle, but not for one we were thinking. Spinosaurus lived a double life, on land being a highly opportunistic predator similar to a bear, supported by the fact small dinosaurs and pterosaurs have been found in the belly of Spinosaurus, 
At the same time, it would have fed on the huge fish of Cretaceous Africa, wading in shallow water and catching the fish with its narrow man-sized snout and claws. Truly an outlandish animal. Oh, and for why it's a duck-like, well, uh, lives in water. And it has short legs, doesn't it? Also, remember when I said it was buoyant? Well... What also floats in water? Bread. Apples. Uh, very small rocks. Cider. A great gravy. Cherries. Mud. A churches. Churches. Lead. Lead. A duck. <laughs> exactly. Is it possible that dinosaurs could get even duckier? Astoundingly, yes. Let's go back to raptors. Not just those raptors. Raptors as in fossil robbers as well. Fossil poaching is one of the largest obstacles stopping scientists from getting scientifically important specimens, which was shown in 2015 when a rather peculiar fossil specimen from Mongolia was handed over to paleontologists in Brussels after circulating among collectors. When the fossil was described in 2017, paleontologists brought forth onto the world an animal like no other, except of course it was almost exactly like a duck, and this time I am not hyperbolic. Halscoraptor is a dromaeosaurid, however branched off relatively early on the taxonomic tree in its own subfamily, Halscoraptorinae. Because of this, it's unlike any other dromaeosaur, although it does retain its sickle-like claw. It's only about the size of a chicken, and uniquely has a premaxilla that forms into a spoon-shaped bill. This, along with an elongated neck, short flipper-like arms, and a neurovascular network in the snout, which is common in aquatic predators, all point to Halscoraptor being the first dinosaur to not just live near water, but is adapted for swimming. That, combined with its appearance, shows that our journey is over. I crown this lad the duck dinosaur to end all duck dinosaurs. So, that's a good majority of all dinosaurs that can at least be remotely compared to ducks. However, all of these animals presented aren't just sort of duck-like, but also are some of the most revealing, interesting, and bizarre dinosaurs discovered. Weird duck dinosaurs also show the diversity of dinosaurs. As always, thanks to all my sources I used to create these videos. This was a much more deeper research video than some of the others, and I definitely needed a lot of sources for this one. As always, if you want to learn about any of the dinosaurs referenced, I'll link to their Wikipedias in the description, so you can also go down the same rabbit holes that I did while making this video. Also, big thanks to Hyro Trio Skin, whose beautiful artwork I used to make this video. He has a ton of great paleo art, and check him out on DeviantArt. Once more, thank you for watching this video till the end, and see ya.